Hey everyone, welcome to The Edge of It All. I'm your host, Trey Edge, and I look forward to going on this journey with you. Each episode, I'll talk to guests of all walks of life, and I'll ask them the -the behind-the-scenes truths we all want to know. I'll reach out to newsmakers, celebrities, athletes, and ordinary individuals who were there during some of the biggest events of our time. Together, we will hear the story behind the story. So let's get started. This is The Edge of It All. Welcome, everyone, to the latest episode of The Edge of It All. I'm your host, Trey Edge. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to our podcast on whatever podcast stream you have chosen today. Do not forget our home studio where you can get this podcast and many, many others. That's UBN Go International Network, UBN Go International Network. Our guest today can literally be called a legend and a pioneer, and that is not with exaggeration. She was the first woman to head a broadcast television network as chairwoman of Fox Broadcasting Company. She's had a hand in bringing in some of the most revolutionary TV programs, including Star Trek, The Next Generation, X-Files, The Oprah Winfrey Show, and yep, she even brought the NFL to Fox. But that is just the tip of the iceberg, and we are here to let her bring us the story behind the story. Please welcome Lucy Salhaney to the edge of it all. Lucy, thanks for being with us today. Well, thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Appreciate you taking the time. And we had some brief moments before that we probably could have recorded, made our own separate show. (laughs) (laughs) As you could probably tell me, sometimes the stuff off camera is better than what's on camera, right? (laughs) Certainly. Except (laughs) off camera, I don't wear makeup. So there you (laughs) go. You know, I started doing my research and going down a path and looking at things to talk to you about, and I anticipated it going in a certain direction, but wow, what a life that you have lived and what a career. And it, I am just so thrilled to be able to go down a couple of these roads with you and just hear your thoughts on what you've done and where we are, but what an incredible journey you've been on. Um, I was telling my friend that a friend of mine that I was doing this today and I said, they must think it's toward the end of my life because (laughs) they want this for posterity. Um, But I'm here to tell you, you'll have to do another one because I'm going to be around for a long time. I I love that. Um, (laughs) Let's see. I think that, I started off thinking I was going to be an elementary education teacher because huh. when I when I um, was going from high school to college, you could be a nurse, you could be a teacher, and there was that was it. And what you really did was get married and have kids and support your lifestyle, you know, support your family that way. And working was really only temporary um, and only to help your spouse. And so that's what I was going to do. Yeah. I went to Kent State University and um, about three months in, I realized um, studying wasn't for me because I was convinced I knew everything about everything. (laughs) I joined every committee I could. I ran for office in my dorm and one and was And it was too busy going to meetings and things. And I would go to class. My grades were okay. But I decided I could never be an elementary education teacher because I was too assertive, too mouthy, too independent. So I left school. Oh, fascinating. I was there a year. A year. This this interview may take longer than the time I was at school. (laughs) That is great. When you when you chose to go down the path you did go into, you, you worked as a secretary at a station in Cleveland, and you know you moved into the ultimate positions where you were with Paramount, Fox, UPN. When did you know that this was the direction, and when did you know that you could make a difference in the entertainment industry? I say I tell people this, and they think I'm crazy. 
I think about a month after I got into that television station, I fell in love with it. It was everything in life I loved. Um, we were, I was at an independent station, and the fact that it was an independent station, they didn't have independence then. All they had were network affiliates, and so I felt like I was doing something. I was always for the underdog, and I was you know, rough and ready and ready to go and beat those other guys. Mm-hmm. Um, and I loved it. There was nothing about it I didn't love. The problem was the world didn't love me. Exactly, was, yeah. Yeah, I was a woman. I was a uh, secretary. I was really good secretary. I knew it could always fall back on that. <laughs> um, and um, I, I did everything. I was very bossy. I was bossy from the time I was born. But they got me working in the news department because I'd finished my work in programming. I was program manager, secretary, and I'd go back to the news department and work. And my boss got frustrated and the news people wanted me to stay and I wanted to stay, but I couldn't anyway. So but that was it. Um, Then I was married at the time, the first time. And and, um, everybody kept telling me, when are you going to stay home? When are you going to quit? And my boss's wife, it was a a real problem for me. Mm -hmm. And my boss's wife gave me the uh, the feminine mystique. Okay. And I read the book. I don't know if you've ever read it because it's like Beowulf. It's so far before your time. But um, it gave me a whole new outlook. And it gave me the courage to say, this is really what I want in life. I want a career. And I'm allowed to have a career and Absolutely. move forward. That and really that was, what, was did you have a goal? I mean, could you say at that time, this yeah. is my goal. This is what I want to do. I wanted my boss's job. And I told him that. <laughs> Where did that, I have to ask that assertiveness. You either learn it or you're born with it. Where do you where does that come from for you? My mother. OK. Because it's very obvious, and when you tell the story, that's a common theme I've already picked up on. So you just wonder, was that a life lesson thing, or is that just something you grew with? It was my mother and her family. My mother was very strong. She was was an amazing woman. Amazing. And she would tell me, the one thing she told me, and I told a lot of people this. In fact, I I I think back, Dana Walden worked for me early mm-hmm. on and she's an amazing person that's for later but um i i said when you walk into a room because my mother taught me this and you're scared and there are all these people looking at you just throw your shoulders back hold your head high and look them in the eye and mm-hmm. uh that was the best advice i could have ever gotten fantastic we, when you hear people now you know when we do an interview like this and we introduce you and words come out like first, revolutionary, influential, all that. And I and I we we talk. You come, you know, very modest and very humble. But what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear those words? What do you think? It makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, because listen, I loved when I what I was doing. I loved it. There were times I didn't, of course, but overall, it was the best of times. And I don't think I did. Those just happened. That's what I wanted. I had people in all steps of my career that were um, co-workers, that were mentors, that were um, really should have more credit than just me. I, it was always a team effort. I, so I can't think about that. I mean, I love it. Don't, don't yeah. get me wrong, but I don't walk around talking about it a lot. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> you let us do that for you. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> what was the atmosphere, the climate for women and, I, and we're going to talk a little bit about your time at Fox in just a couple of minutes. But I'm, I'm going to the point where you were getting into the business. Okay. What was the climate like then? I could tell you stories and this would become a mini series, but um, it 
there were no women. There were very no. few. And we kind of stuck together. Uh, but there were so few of us. And I wanted programming. Um, and that's really what I loved, marketing. And that's how I came up, marketing, promotion, and then programming. Um, but I, I can give you some examples. Sure, um, would love it. I, I wanted to be a general manager of a television station. Okay. And I love television stations because I think that is where it really begins. And I knew television business like I know nothing else. And um, I was working for a company. I'm not going to talk about, well, I will, Taft Broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And I was head of programming for all their stations. And by the way, I didn't discover Oprah. I tried to get her to be syndicated through her company. And when I couldn't, um, we bought her show for all our stations. We were the first station group outside of ABC. Okay. I believe okay. her so much, and I, I wanted to do it. And everybody goes, oh, she's a African-American woman. She's a black woman at that time. You know? Oh, yeah. do you think it's going to work? Anyway, um, you can edit that if you want. But no, that's, no really, that's really what happened. So, raw, story, raw story is what we're after. That's perfect. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to be a general manager, and I was – I was working in programming, and we started Entertainment Tonight with Paramount. It was us and um, uh, Cox Stations and uh, Taft Cox Stations and Paramount. We started it, and who knew it would be what it was? And then um, we worked on Solid Gold and things. So I was pretty involved in in national programming for a television group. Right. But I re- what? No, I was just I was saying I understand. All right. Okay. I'm, I'm with you. Okay, so but I wanted to be a general manager because I did. So I went to my boss and I said, she said, what do you want? We had an opening in our Washington station. And I said, I want to be the general manager. And he looked at me and said, we were my husband and I were in the process of adopting a, our, uh, a child. He said, but you want to have a child. Hmm. And I said, well, so what? And he said, well, and you want to live in Boston? I said, no, I'll live in Washington. My husband can compute, commute. Oh, no, we can't have that. Amazing. Another time, when the first interview I had at the TV station, the general manager asked me if I was on the pill. So <laughs> that was kidding. the atmosphere. Women were um, women. They were not executives. They were not junior executives. They. It was tough. It was tough. But fun. It was tough. Is it amazing to you now to look at how things have changed and maybe they're not still where you would love for them to be, but how much has changed in your role in that? There's not enough change. Yeah. It's still, by the way, I'm not only talking about women, I'm talking about minorities. There's still not enough enough change, not enough equality uh, of thought. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's always driven me crazy. One of the people, and I was thinking about this interview, one of the people, I was hoping you'd ask me something like, who are the people I respect the most? I would love it. And one of them is Bob Johnson from BET. BET, yes. We invested in BET, our company, Taft, and with John Malone and maybe Cox, because we did a lot together. But... um, we invested in it. And I met Bob at the time and he started BET and he started with a group and he was located in a building behind our Washington DC television station. Okay. And the building was like a shack. I mean, it was fine, but it was nothing that you could imagine. Right. Or should have. Bob was amazing. He was very, focus very clear of mind he had the support of his people they liked him and i don't care what you hear and what went on but i respect him respected him and respect him so much for what he accomplished he's one of the people i look at and say that's amazing and he deserves every sec he deserves every second of the accolades there had to have been those people and and you know you went to Paramount, you talked about some of the shows you you did. I mean, Entertainment Tonight, the whole Star Trek thing. 
the next generation, I have to ask you, <laughs> was there a love of that type of programming that you just had to, that you gravitated to? Because the question that comes to me is, is it a gut feeling or is it something you see, a feeling you get that says this is going to work? Or is it just a leap of faith? Well, Star Trek is an interesting subject because uh, when I was at the television, see, everything begins at the television station because sure. they're the doorway to the home. And we had Star Trek, the original ones, 79. And our station group didn't have a lot of money. I mean, they were independents. We were making some money. Most of us were losing because we were uh, just starting. We were UHF. And we used to run Star Trek at 7 o'clock from 7 to 8 at night. Some ran at 6 to 7. Anyway, we, we had to figure out in those days how to get an audience and how to be different. I mm -hmm. mean, when you think about what these stations are running, stripping programming Monday through Friday, like ION and others, or streaming, right. television stations, independent stations were doing that long, long before any of these guys woke up to it. So we ran, we stripped Star Trek. And um, we would do in the, in the, Order it was first on NBC. We would then promote um, uh, Shatner's favorite ones. And then we would, <laughs> so we, we manipulated, manipulated. I got to know the cast. Okay. Because they would do promos for us. And gotcha. I love the show. I must have seen every one 15 times. I love it. Love it. Okay, anyway, that makes so, sense. but I wasn't the only one. My boss, Mel Harris, who was really the guy behind my going to Paramount and the, my mentor and my best friend who became uh, chairman or president of, of Paramount and Sony. Um, when he was at Paramount, let's skip forward, we wanted to do the fourth network. Mm -hmm. And it was always going to be, we brought Star Trek back and it was mm -hmm. going to anchor it. Well, we couldn't get Gulf and Western to really agree to that and for its network, all this crap. So it, it went dormant. When I went to Paramount then, um, I said, we have to do Star Trek. We have to. And network, John Pike, who produced the show and did a phenomenal job, um, John said, well, I want to go to the network with it. We said, you can't, because we were in syndication. Am I, okay. if I, am I talking to... No, no, no. It's a great story. We were in syndication, so we we said, no, we want to take it out in syndication. So John took it to the network, and the networks were sort of interested. NBC, I think, because the NBC was still a part owner in it, gave an eight order, eight hours, and I'm going, eight hours? Give me a break. <laughs> and then um, he went to Fox, and Fox at that time, because they were the fourth network, was my enemy. I hated the facts that Fox beat Paramount and us to the fourth network. I hated them. Really? I just detested them. So, and and uh, I did, it was, it became a life fight for me <laughs> not huh. to let it go. So a guy named Steve Goldman, who was our exec VP sales, and Greg Mydell, and our whole team at Paramount, put the he our heads together and we went to Paramount and said, we will guarantee one year, maybe we did two, but anyway, definitely one year's episodes. We will go out and we will renew the original 79 on all these stations. I, we did two years on Star Trek years, and we will yeah. renew. Well, it brought in so much money to the company, potential money that Nobody could match it. Huh. So we fought for it and fought for it. Then we had to go tell Gene and present it to him. So we went in the room, and I will. this is one thing I will take credit for. I'm pitching <laughs> the, my the, heart. The one thing you're going to take credit No, for. this is really important <laughs> because I'm pitching my heart out to Gene. And I said, Gene. First of all, Gene was a genius, but put that aside. I said, Gene, there are people, there, there's a whole group of people that have never seen Star Trek. Yeah. They don't know. And I said, you have a whole new generation. You have a whole, an opportunity to present Star Trek to the next generation. 
The next generation. And James looked at me and said, that's the title. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing yeah. how that comes together. Yeah. You you do that and, and you wind up leaving Paramount and you just said, so I'm going to take you there. You said Fox was your enemy. Oh, yeah. That's how you saw him. Yet that's where you wind up, at least for a little while. <laughs> You wind about up with long as, I, I wound up there about as long as I wound up in college. Um, well, <laughs> but long I enough, see. but long enough to see success and to do things there. I mean, look, let's be real. I'm from a football crazed family. So when you start researching Lucy Salhani and it's the NFL deal with Fox, <laughs> first I have to go, okay, wait, was she a Cleveland fan, Steelers fan? I kind of heard both. <laughs> Um, I left Paramount because I wanted to do a network. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to offer, not me. I thought it was important that we go out there and offer another network. And um, we put together a plan like we did with Star Trek. And we were going to use, we were going to do the second Star Trek, launch the network, go on. And and, and we were working with, uh, we were very close with Universal. And we were this close to it, this close. Mm-hmm. I can't even tell you. We were ready to announce. And Martin Davis nixed it. Mm-hmm. And he was running Paramount um, at the time. And it broke my heart. I thought this was the mistake. Then I went to them and tried to get them to do a um, cable network mm-hmm. with MCA, uh, with Universal, with our movies. And what, early on, this is in 93, no one was really doing it. I said, w- we can push programming on there and really move ahead. And neither company really saw it. They, <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, what a mistake. So uh. I hell with this, I'm going, and then I saw Barry Diller who I idolized, still do, at a conference. And he walked up to me, he says, how long is your contract? And I said, call my attorney. And that was the beginning. And I went to work for Barry Diller. And you, okay, your time at Fox, I mentioned the NFL, everything that you did there, and I think maybe three, three and a half years or so that you were there, Diller leaves Fox. Barry, Barry was my boss. Yeah. In my and I can tell you all of this. I um, in my contract it had that I only reported to Barry. Oh wow! And Barry had in his contract he only reported to the to the chairman, which was Ru- Rupert. Right. So I went there as head of twentieth television, not okay. the network. And Barry's Barry's. Uh, Barry told me I had to remove all the department heads and change them because it was old and stodgy and we weren't going anywhere in that department. And the last show we had sold was uh, MASH Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we weren't with it, so on and so forth. So, and I also had syndication and worldwide sales. So I went there and um, accomplished those things. In that accomplishment, I brought on um, Jim Giannopoulos. Mm-hmm. who be- later became the uh, genius that he is, the head of Fox, um, for international, and um, two others. I, I don't need to go into them. And I and Harris Cattleman left as head of network, and I made a mistake because um, it became very political that the Harris left. He was very tied in with Hollywood. And I didn't care. He wasn't doing his job. And I guess when I walked out of his office one day and he patted my ass, I thought, you know, I, I don't think he understands that he's working for me. So okay. that, that takes me there. So you just said he patted your ass. Yes, I was walking so, out. So it, take me there. Boys Club, fair to say. Oh, you want to hear boys stories? The Boys Club stories were... There, that one of the agencies used to have a dinner. It was all boys club. Forget that. Yeah. But there were some really good guys. Hey, you know, people don't, I mean, they didn't get up one morning and say, we're going to have a boys club. Yeah. They just gravitated toward people they were comfortable with. Sure. You know, I'm a 
who's going to gravitate toward one single woman? That's just uh, unless you have other things in mind. But that, that, <laughs> I mean, nobody did it intentionally. Right. And we, we're just coming out of the Mad Men era where you went drinking, you know, at lunch and had a couple of drinks and you played bricksmanship and then you went back to work and flirted and then you went home to your spouse. You know, I mean, come on. But um, William Morris used to sponsor this event for the Boys and Girls Club, I think it was. And um, all the studios would. Maybe it was just the Boys Club. Anyway, all the studios would buy tables and they would go. And so everybody came to me and said, we want to buy a table. And I said, oh, great. I'd love to go. And they said, well, there are no women allowed. Oh, wow. And I said, what? And they said, no women allowed. So I called the the person at William Morris who was heading it up, uh, uh, an executive, major guy. And I said, what is this? He said, well, that's just been tradition. I said, well, let me tell you something. I was so furious. Because it's not a, it's about exclusion. Mm -hmm. Because if you're excluded, you're not on the same level. And I, I swear, I could go back story after story after story. You don't want to hear them all. They bore me. <laughs> but I told everybody on my staff, everybody that worked for us, I said, no one's going. You want to go? You pay your own way. You're not oh, going to wow. write it off. I said, I am terribly against this and i you know and then I, I let harris go and it became very political and people said well she shouldn't really be here and this and that so but but barry backed me he said i was absolutely right and i loved it and i went on and when i was at uh 20th we came up um i didn't i just went to peter and said um our head of uh, network programming. You know, when I was at entertain at Paramount, when we put on a story about aliens and about the government together, our ratings would skyrocket that there was mm -hmm. a conspiracy. I said, let's get a show that is a conspiracy um, about aliens. And he came back with that show. And I could not believe it. And so we we did a pilot, and we presented it to Paramount. I mean, to uh, Fox. And we went into the screening room, and Rupert was sitting next to me. I was um, I had just become become head of the network, so I was sort of in both worlds. And um, San, the the person in charge of programming, Sandy Grushaw, didn't like it at all. No. He didn't think it was. He did, well, it's okay. He didn't like yeah. it. And he didn't want it. And I leaned over to Rupert and I said, Rupert, this show is incredible. I said, it is just incredible. And uh, he watched it and he said, okay, I like it. I like it a lot. We made some minor changes. Like mm -hmm. we put it on and it didn't have the Chiron that went. <laughs> right, right, that right. We knew where it was, the locator and everything. And, we, those, and Sandy did that. And then he, you know, was top on getting that show produced. It was great. When you look at all this, your time at Fox and I, you know, huh. everything you've done, Paramount and everything else, I, I just have to ask you, with your experience, your life, your career, the things you've done and your ability to sit and look at things now, is it even possible to explain in a way that's understandable for us how media has changed just even re you know in the last what a pick a decade maybe i don't even know it's just changed so much well yes it's not only media it's news yeah yes i mean the news media it's not only the entertainment it's news i again i'm i'm sorry i'm going to go on and on but okay. when, there, when there were broadcast networks you were under because you were using the public airways, you were under rules and regs that said, here's what you could do. And here's what you were allowed to do. And here's what news was allowed to do. If you showed one side of a controversial issue, you had to show the other. Sometimes we didn't do as good a job, but we, we tried. We right. were licensed. We were federally licensed. When cable came along, they usurped our shows. 
all cable was, it started because they supposedly wanted to reach parity of signal or viewership in the rural areas, and they wanted to have more local programming, which was BS. All they wanted to do was grow their cable companies to make money and to, the way I didn't like Fox was the way they wanted to do it to the networks because mm-hmm. they competition, you go out there. But that was the mistake because what they did, and the government allowed it, was take programming. They, they, cable was built on not only HBO movies, which they, that were produced by the networks that they bought directly, but all, but but I mean by the studios. But also they took the television stations that were free to you over the air, put them on cable. And supposedly gave them to you free, but you paid for cable. So you didn't know what you were paying for. There wasn't tearing. It's just, okay. I'm a witness to that. So I compared it to you buy a car, you park it in front of your house. And I, I made speeches about this. I hated them. You made speeches. Of you, 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 somebody gets in your car, drives it, puts a bubble on top, charges to take people around, comes back puts the car back in front of your house, leaves, and has the money. Yeah. And they've used your car. Yeah. Okay, so there's retransmission and all that crap. But what really happened was they started taking audience away. Yeah. And they had subscription fees. So when you have a subscription fee, you get twice for the – you get more, more money for uh, your programming than – this over there because all they're depending on is is advertising. advertising so that, yeah. that was the death now for broadcast television, which was free. Yep. The second part of it was they stepped on our necks when they came up with news 24-7. Yes. There is nothing that needs to be on over and over and over Thank and you. over. So (laughs) it has created a major problem. And instead of being sort of um, objective, they're not. So it's, it's a disaster. I would say. So is anyone, if I asked you who's telling the truth in news, is there an answer to that? I'm sorry. I lost you. That's okay. If I asked you who's telling the truth in news, yeah. Is there an answer to that? No, no one what's, is. Because what's interesting is I had a journalism background, and I, re, I specifically remember taking classes where you gathered the facts and you presented them, and the reader made their, you know, kind of formed their opinion. And now it's like everything's an editorial 24 hours a day. There's nobody, absolutely nobody, because it's a free for all. You can say anything you want. And the fact, and this is my favorite day, story of the day, CBS just took a reporter's computer and records which had con- that, that were confidential. So goodbye, First Amendment. Yes. So now yes. the government's going to tell us or somebody who's got the most, biggest, the deepest pockets is going to tell us what we can say. So who and now we have AI. There is nobody we can believe. Maybe you, maybe guys who do no Trey. I'm serious. Maybe people who do podcasts yeah. because you don't you don't work for the man. You don't um, you, you don't bow down to any bigger, uh, any richer, any more controlling source. So maybe that's the only thing. I don't know, but I don't believe anybody anymore. Yeah, I don't either. And it's it's a very, you know, you raise children. It's a frustrating thing to watch happen, especially 24 hours a day, 24-7, just like you said. If I took you now to this place you, you've been in this career, what would be your advice to women? I know you've been a a staunch defender of women's rights, and you mentioned on this podcast, it's not just about women. It's about minorities, and it's about inclusion. But what would you tell those people who are entering this industry now? Take your pick, whether it's in entertainment or news, whatever it may be. Well, 
there is more of an advantage now, certainly for um, minorities than there used to be. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you you used to walk into a network meeting, and if you saw a, a skin tone other than than pure white, or in my my um, or in my case, Middle Eastern, um, <laughs> you 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 would think you're in the wrong place. Yeah. Um, you got to stick it out, and in some ways, you have to play the game. You can't always be pushing um, because people get afraid of that yeah. and they're insidious ways of holding you back. I, I think you just have to do your job and work as hard as you can. I mean, everybody we used to leave and I'd still be there at eight o'clock at night. My mm -hmm. first marriage ended because my husband said I wanted my career more than him and he was right. Um, and you got to want it really bad. And you have to do your homework. You can't just get it because you're, you know, you're there. You have to really work very, very, very hard. Um, and it's not easy. I don't envy anyone now. It's a different kind of world. What are you proudest of? In my life? Yeah. You mean my career or my life? I'll, I'll give you both. You can do, you can answer both. <laughs> In my life, I'm proudest of my family, my two boys, and um, my grandchildren. I have two little and a step-granddaughter. I, I just, they're the best things that ever happened. And if you want to co-star, my two-year-old would, would be happy to <laughs> co-star with you. Um, in my career, From from a, a a pure programming standpoint, Arsenio Hall. Really? Yeah, I just and um, Entertainment Tonight. I think that was so far before all of them, but Arsenio, E.T., of course, Star Trek, Star Trek, which again we crammed down everyone's throat. Um, but that wasn't only me; that was the team. Arsenio, they're all team efforts. And from a from a, a work standpoint, all the people I worked with, yeah. they were unbelievable. And I could name you all of them. They were just incredible, incredible people. Well, I heard the way you talked about Bob Johnson. And, I, and, I, and I've read, you know, all the stuff that goes on at Fox. I've heard how you've talked about Roger Ayers as well. I mean, you know, there's people that have influenced that you've had. It seems like such respect for admiration Did you say Roger Ailes? Yes. I loved Roger. Yeah. That's why I brought him up. <laughs> I loved Roger. I thought he was one of the smartest guys ever. Um and he ran a network I didn't agree with. Um I didn't agree with any very very little that he did, but I thought he was smart and I, I the last time I saw him, I think I was quoted, I walked in his room and he started crying. Because I hadn't seen him in a while, and that's how much I loved him. Wow. Well, you know, it, there's a lesson in that, is there not? You don't have to agree on everything. <laughs> you just oh, have yeah, to. And in this world we live in, it's like this, you know, it's this dividing line that you're on either side of. And it's a constant going back and forth. And if you're on that side, you're automatically the bad guy and you're wrong. And the story you just told about, you said, I didn't agree with a lot of what they did, but I loved him. Th there's something to that that I think is much deeper than, you know, the, the programming we chose. Well, we grew up a long time. I mean, we grew up together in the business. Yeah. There were, that was the era. Now it's a little different. It's run, you know. The, the line used to be when we were at Paramount, we would be in the, you know, the uh, Lucille Ball bungalow where we were in the admin building. Now it's you're in us. Uh, and I, I don't want to pick on CBS. I don't mean to. But now you're in uh, C2 and you your furniture can be D1 because you're at this level E and it's lost its its personality and and I, I, that, there's no doubt about it if you're going to see broadcast television disappear yeah. within my lifetime it's going to be yeah. gone 
Yeah. And we're going to have streaming with ads, which is goes back to the future. I mean, it goes back to broadcast television that was free. Government has been played a terrible part in it. Um, and I want to just talk about the NFL for a minute, Trey. Absolutely. I wish I could take credit for creating that idea. Um, Rupert, it was really Rupert's idea. He wanted um, sports. Those of us who were at the network weren't sure we wanted sports. And he and Chase Carey were very strong on it. And Sandy Grushaw wasn't. And I said, you know, yeah, maybe it'll work. And I got into it and I started researching because I didn't think we had a chance. Mm -hmm. And the way we pitched the NFL, and I'm going to tell you this, and I've told others, so it won't be a first, but we did a lot of work. We did ads and we did, because it was really the first time that um, a, a major sports team could marry with Hollywood. And that's Hi. the that's the angle we took. So our division, I mean, all, all network and all of television got together. And the research showed that uh, the networks were losing young audience. We had the young audience. They weren't bringing them in. They were stodgy, and they weren't promoting sports enough at all. And when they did, it wasn't cool, and we were cool. So the more I got into it, the more I was, we're going to get this thing if it kills us. I mean, th that was it. So um, we did, we did uh, Simpsons jackets. With mm -hmm. the logo of the NFL with it. We sent everybody on the television committee huge baskets with all our, our videos and as much of st Hollywood stuff as we could send them. And, and we sent them and said, this is the first mar this is the first part of the marriage. And the research we did was phenomenal because we correlated their audiences with ours. And I think that's really, really what what tipped the scale, the work everybody did. So Chase, Carrie, and I flew down to uh, Texas to present in person with, with our team to present everything. And it was only Chase and I. And, you know, I love football, but I'm, I am I love the Browns. That was it. It was the Browns. Who, who the hell cared about anybody else? We hated the Steelers, and that was it. So I go, and on my way, to the uh, meeting, I wrote the NFC and the AFC teams on my hands. Uh -huh. So when I was pitching, instead of having to look at a paper, I, I could look down and say to uh, Art Modell, well, Art, or say to Jerry Johnson, you know, and I had, right. okay. So we go into the meeting, and we're sitting there, and I am pitching my heart out. And they're kind of looking at me like I'm from Mars, but it was okay. And Chase is doing a phenomenal job and, and talking about money and all. And we're pitching and pitching. And, and uh, so then they said, okay, we want to go around the table and see which team, which who you'd rather have. And so Chase, we thought at the time we would be able to get the AFC, because okay. we didn't think NBC would pay as much. Okay. And I didn't really care about the AFC. I wanted the NFC or Monday Night Football. I really wanted Monday Night Football the most yeah. because it made sense for us and all. But the NFC was where we needed to go because it was in top 10 markets. And that's where we got our audience, not from these you know small markets in the AFC. So we're sitting there and they go to Chase and Chase is pitching the AFC and they ask somebody else um, and they're pitching the AFC. And so they asked me and I went, well, I guess it's the NFC because I had written and I'm right handed. <laughs> and we left there, we came back and we, you know, we put in the bid and how much Later, we went over to um, Chase and I went over to NFL headquarters, the, the bastion of maleness. And, yes, it is. Uh, we went into the conference room and, and I'm telling you this, I don't think anyone knows this story. Uh, we walked in and there were NBC's papers on the table. Are you kidding? No, it outlined their whole bid. Oh. And oh. Chase... 
I said, Chase, look at this. He said, we got to stall this meeting. How could they have done this? So Chase grabbed the papers, and I said, go to the men's room, and I'll stall. And we did. And we came out, and we made our bid for the NFC. Fantastic. We called Rupert in between while they were talking among themselves, and Rupert said, go higher. I love him for that. I don't love him for a lot, but I love him for that. Go higher. I want it. I want it. We said, no, Rupert, we can't go higher. We were okay. So we left there, and we went back to the office, and he paced in front of our offices. And Chase and I said, we're going to go hide. So we went and had lunch or something. We hid from Rupert. And then we went to Rupert's apartment, and they called his condo for me, and I got Mm -hmm. it. And they said, congratulations, you got the NFC. What an incredible story. And now the NFL on Fox is absolutely, I I mean, it it is to say it's a Sunday ritual or whatever you want to say. And And let me tell you something. I wish I could pat myself on the back. This was by no means a Lucy Salhaney. This was David Hill, who was a genius when it came to producing. And I didn't, Rupert said, you're going to have this guy, Rupert, with his Australian accent, you're going to have this guy from from London, and he and this, I don't know, and 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 he didn't want me to have anything to do with sports because I was a woman. Rupert was the worst, anyway. But David Hill, who I fell in love with, we became very close. We worked as as close as could be. All the marketing people, every marketing person at Fox, Chris, Chase Carey, who was unbelievable. These are the people that got the NFL to Fox, not Lucy. I was one of the players, but these are real winners. Well, and that's a great place for us to stop for today. I'd love to have you back on. We could talk for hours, but but you just said something. And that I'm is, sorry, Trey. No, no, we're great. We're great. This has been perfect. But it's interesting what you just said. This is not a Lucy Salhaney story. What's great, though, is you were there. And throughout all these things that we've discussed, whether it was how you started or Star Trek or the Arsenio Hall show so many different landmark events in the history of entertainment and television. Whether you want to say this isn't a Lucy story or not, you were there and it matters. And I love that and that you were willing to come on here and talk to us about it and tell us some of these stories. And look, we'll do it again and we'll just okay. pick a subject. We'll just pick a subject and we'll spend an hour on that. How's that? <laughs> I promise I won't talk as much. Thank you for inviting me. No, it's perfect. It's perfect. And we can't, again, by the way, anything you want people to know before we go that you're doing now or that you want somebody to follow you any certain place, anything like that? Yeah, I'll tell you quickly, very quickly. Uh, One of my, I I consult and I sit on some boards of companies, but one of my latest things is internet and privacy and how you can protect yourself. And I'm working with a company that, um, and I don't need to go into it, it's, it's called Sly Number, but uh, you get a, a second line and you can't be traced on the internet. Okay. And it's, it's I, what I want to say to people is, forget the company, be careful, be careful, because yeah. everything is being sold, they have all our information, and we don't know how, how bad it's going to get, so we have to protect ourselves. Lucy, thank you so much. And thank you for sharing your story with us. And thank you for all the contributions that you've made entertaining us (laughs) and the important steps you've taken, not just for entertainment, but for women, minorities, and everything you've referenced in this this short little snippet in our podcast. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Trey. Thanks for having me. It was fun. I'm going to go take off my makeup. Goodbye. (laughs) Thanks to Lucy for coming on the show. That'll wrap up this episode of The Edge of It All. Be sure to listen to us on UBN Go International Network or wherever you get your podcast streams. You can find us across all social media and everywhere you get your favorite podcast. Thanks again to Lucy Salhaney for coming on the show and sharing one of the most successful and influential stories of our time. We appreciate everyone listening to the edge of it all, where you will always get the story behind the story, each episode, a new one, and something you've never heard before. Talk to you soon, everybody.